why didn't Islam abolish slavery? Okay, and the way that that question is worded is perfect because it shows the whole problem with the framing. We have the words abolish and we have the word slavery. There's no such thing as slavery in Islam. There's riq. There's a different word and a different concept. You can't just translate words, words across languages and assume that they mean the exact same thing. So when we say slavery in English, we imagine something. What do we imagine, especially those who are from North America? We imagine the experience of slavery in North America, which was one of the worst, most ridiculously unjust, uh, racist forms of, of, of servitude or bondage, whatever you want to call it, that's ever existed in, in human history, right? If you want an analog to what is permitted in Islamic law under certain circumstances and with strict rules and guidelines, the analog is not slavery. The analog is refugee resettlement. That is a closer analog to what is permitted in Islam than slavery as we know it in North America. Because, and this is something that I try to drive home to people, you know, for, for us here in Utica, we understand the, the life of, of refugees a little bit more than most people because we have a lot of refugees in our community. And you meet some of these refugees and they've spent years, if not decades, in refugee camps. And ask them, what is the situation in these refugee camps? How is life like? How many people make it into these refugee camps? What happens, right? And, and all of this goes back to a broader question, which is about what should happen with non-combatants after a war or a battle has taken place? Because that's the only possible way for someone to become, uh, quote unquote, enslaved uh, within Islamic law is there's a battle. It's military aged men against military aged men on the battlefield. Okay, let's say one side wins, the other side loses. All the men are killed, or most of them, and some of them are taken prisoner and some of them flee. They leave behind dependents. They have women that they left behind. They have children that they left behind. They have elderly and different sort of religious people that are left behind. Who's going to take care of them now? That's the question that Islamic law tries to solve when it talks about riq. Okay, what happens now? I want anybody, if you know anybody from Palestine or from Iraq or from Syria or these countries that have experienced warfare in the last 10 years and have had huge refugee populations, ask them what happens to refugees there, okay? Sometimes they're slaughtered mercilessly, women, children, elderly. Sometimes if they're fortunate, they make it to a refugee camp where they live for decades on handouts. Sometimes they're exploited in order to get bare necessities. Sometimes they're sexually exploited. Sometimes children are captured and sold into sexual slavery. Sometimes women are raped or women are taken advantage of in order to be given their basic needs to survive. Is this a great system? It's a horrible system. We see a very, very few amount of people who are able to get on a plane and come to places like the United States or Europe or something like that. And we say, wow, you know, mashallah, this is working great, right? But what about all the people that are left behind? Right? They're out of sight, and so they're out of mind. We don't see them. We don't recognize that that's actually the norm, much more the norm than the person who gets on a plane and comes to the West. The other thing, what about those few people who do make it to the West? What happens here? We showed a, a, a documentary, not us personally as a meshi, but us as a community down at the, at the, at the theater, um, Utica, The Last Refuge, a beautiful documentary about the refugee kind of resettlement process here in Utica. Okay, it was, a gorgeous, it was a wonderful documentary, a huge community moment. And then what was the first person for the Q&A, the first person to get up and ask a question? What did they say for those who were there? And these people, and they come and they take our tax dollars and they take whatever. What was that? Resentment. Resentment from the native population against people from outside. People feeling that they shouldn't have to pay for other people to come here. Even though the person completely misunderstood the situation, refugee resettlement is different from immigration. Refugee resettlement, the, the refugees actually have to pay the money back at the end. They didn't understand any of that. They were lumping together refugees with migrants. But you could tell the, the, the resentment. And many people in the United States and in Europe now, what do they have towards people who come from outside? Resentment. Okay. So these are, I'm just bringing these things to show what does Islamic law, what are the problems that it has to solve? It has to solve who's going to take care of these people and how do you do it in a way that there's not going to be tons of resentment from the native population, okay? The solution in Islamic law, okay, third thing before I talk about what the actual solution in Islamic law is, does something have to be 100% good to be halal? No, it does not. It can be halal and be 60% good, 70% good, 80% good. Does something have to be pure evil to be haram? Yes or no? 
<laughs> no, don't give me the pens. Yes or no? No. No. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah that alcohol has manafi. That alcohol has benefit. And yet, it's haram. Right? Something can be 60% harmful, 70% harmful, 80% harmful, and it can be haram. Okay? There are things within the Sharia that they are permissible, although they have harm. Although they have harm. Right? And there are things that are haram in the Sharia, even though there are benefits. Or maybe one in a thousand people can do it and like be okay. Right? So there's a probabilistic reasoning, that's what it's called, within the Sharia. Okay? So when we're thinking about solutions to these real problems, actual people, refugees, non-combatants, the solution, it does not have to be 100% good for it to be halal. Okay? And so what is the solution that Islamic law comes up with that the Sharia has for these types of people? The solution is something called riq, okay, which is often, and I think, mistranslated as slavery. Whereas people are placed not within camps, not isolated or ghettoized off by themselves, but they're placed in individual homes and they are assimilated into the culture. How are you going to incentivize that for people? How are you going to stop people from being resentful? You're going to stop people from being resentful by making it halal that that person uses that person's labor. With all of the restrictions that the Sharia also places on that thing. Remember, this is not the slavery of North America, where the, the field hand works, you know, they live in this hut, this shack that's completely falling apart and they eat, you know, leftovers, table scraps. The Prophet ﷺ said that if you have someone like this in this situation, they eat the same food you eat. They wear the same clothes you wear. If you give them something hard to do, you help them with it. And all these different guidelines to make sure that what happened in North America doesn't happen within uh, the Muslim lands. Okay? Is it 100% good? No, it's not 100% good. And we don't have to imagine that it is. The person is away from their culture, away from their homeland, away from their, all those sorts of things. They've got relatives that maybe they were separated from or, or relatives that were, you know, slain in battle. There's harm. But this is the greater possible, the greatest possible answer and situa uh, answer to this delicate situation. How are you going to assimilate? And then all of the sort of thing, don't forget all of the guidance in the Quran and the Sunnah for when to free a slave. You break your fast intentionally during Ramadan, free a slave, Right? The, the secondary interpretation of the ayah in Surah An-Nur, where Allah says, if you see any good in your slaves and they come to you asking you for freedom, do it. Write them a freedom contract. It's called kitabah. It's basically a, a contract to ease them into society. <clears throat> so when you ask the question, why didn't Islam abolish slavery? Because this mechanism is important for society. This mechanism is important for a way to assimilate the families non-combatants within a situation of war into a society where they have a likelihood of accepting Islam, where they're going to be taken care of, they're going to have their basic needs, a roof over their head, a food, shelter, clothing, and they're not going to be taken advantage of or oppressed in any sort of uh, undue, undue way. And Allah knows best.